Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kunja Bihari Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janavalava Giri Vara Dhanadi Giri Vara Dhanadi Jaya Gopi Janavalava Giri Vara Dhanadi Jisodhanandana Braja Janarhan Janaya Jisodhanandana Braja Janarhan Janaya Jamuna Tira Hevana So we'll read from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, and this is uh, verses 12 and 13, no I'm sorry, 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. Before I do, I just want to mention tomorrow is a very, very special day. It's called Aksaya Tritya. It's a day where they take the Bhu deities or the Vigraha deities out of the temple of Jagannath 
and uh, they they take them on procession in a very glorious way with many many uh, devotees doing kirtan and various types of ceremonies going on to Narendra Sarovara, which is a very holy place which Lord Chaitanya used to bathe regularly with his devotees and mostly you find he performed water sports with his devotees. It's a very place where he used to frolic and, and just enjoyed the association with his devotees in a very playful way. <laughs> Um, that's a big, very big tank, and in the middle, not in the middle, but near the shore of the tank, almost in the middle, there's a little temple that's connected from the shore by a bridge, and they take the deities there, and then there's worship, and that goes on for 21 days, so during those 21 days, the Lord gets dressed in his v different costumes in forms of these different pastimes. So he may be doing the rasa dance, he may be lifting Govardhan Hill, he may be killing Agasur demon. And all this is done with great color, flowers, and very nice, amazing designs. I was just viewing some of the pictures today. And uh, so that goes on for 21 days, and then 21 days after that, and that's called Chandan Bhattira, and then there's Chandan and there's another, and during that time, Chandan Yatra, and that's, you know, the Lord is smeared with sandalwood pulp from top to bottom every day during these pastimes. And then in, uh, after those 21 days and all the ceremonies and all the festivals that are held, then it's done 21 days inside the Jagannath Temple for altogether 42 days. And then the Lord is worshipped in a more secluded way with his intimate, you might say, his servants inside the Jagannath Temple. So both of these uh, aspects are, are centered around Chandan and this uh, wonderful festival because it mentions that when, uh, uh, two, there's two different reasons for the origin of the festival. One one is that uh, Lord Jagannath appeared to Indrajumna Maharaj, or King Indrajumna, and told him to smear my body with sandalwood paste and various types of unguents, uh, this fragrance types of uh, powders and uh, scents. And then that was the origin of the actual. And then inside the temple was established by one king called Govinda Dev, his name was. And he was one of the kings of Puri that ruled for nine years. So during these two aspects of the festival, there's great, great, great uh, ceremonies going on. It's very colorful, very festive. And the Lord is worshipped and his leelas, all centered around Chandan. And of course, Jagannath Puri becomes crowded. <laughs> especially during the external parts of that. So it's a very sweet and very intimate festival. So that starts tomorrow for 21 days. And uh, it's mentioned on the calendar. You'll see it on all the Vaishnav calendars like that. And if you like, you can go deeper into the Leelas by doing a little research and you'll find the stories and the festival ceremonies are also mentioned in detail like that. Okay, I wanted to mention that because we shouldn't kind of just pass up tomorrow as another day. It's really a very special day. <laughs> so we should at least remember that the Lord is being worshipped in these different ways. Okay, so we'll begin. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So Advaita Sarva Bhutanam Maitra Karuna Evacha 
Nirmamo Nirhahankara Samatuka Sukha Shami Avesta Sarva Bhutanam Maitra Karuna Evacha Nirmamo Nirhahankara Samadukha Sukha Shami Alvesta Sarva Bhutanam Maitre Karuna Evacha Nirmamo Nirhahankara Samadukha Sukha Shami So there are two verses. Santusta satatam yogi yatamadrida nishayaha mayar pita mano buddhir yam yomad bhakta same priyaha. Word for word. Advesta. Non envious. Sarva bhutanam. Towards all living entities. Maitra. Friendly, Karuna, kindly, Eva, certainly, Cha, also, near Mama, with no sense of proprietorship, Nira Hankara, without false ego, Sama, equal. Dukkha, in distress, Sukha, and happiness, Shami, forgiving, Santusta, satisfied, Satatam, always, Yogi, one engaged in devotion, Yata Atma, self control, Dhrita Nischaya, with determination. Mayi, upon me, arpita, engaged. Try to respond together. It sounds like everybody's in different places. It should be one voice on a response. Okay, to connect. It's easy if you just, as soon as I end, you speak, don't wait. Mana, mind. Buddhi, 
and intelligence. Ya, one who. Mad Bhakta, my devotee. Sa, he. May, to me. Priya, dear. Okay, so Krishna is speaking. In this chapter is called Devotional Service. One who is not envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor, and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-control, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. Hmm. Krishna describes some of the qualities that attract him to his devotees. These, this, these qualities are foundational for attracting the mercy of Krishna. Purport, Come again, coming again to the point of pure devotional service, the Lord is describing the transcendental qualities of a pure devotee in these two verses. A pure devotee is never disturbed in any circumstances nor is he envious of anyone, nor does a devotee become his enemy's enemy. He thinks, this person is acting in my enemy due to my own past misdeeds. So it's better to suffer than to protest. The Srimad Bhagavan, Tam 10, 14, 8, it is said, it is stated, Tate nukampa shushya mikshyaman ho bhujana evat mikritam vipakam Whenever a devotee is in distress or has fallen into difficulty, he thinks that it is the Lord's mercy upon him. He thinks, thanks to my past misdeeds, I should suffer far, far greater than I am suffering now. So it is by the mercy of the Supreme Lord that I am not, not getting all of the punishment I am due. I am just getting a little by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he is always calm, quiet, and patient despite many distressful conditions. A devotee is always kind to everyone, even to his enemy. Nirmama means that a devotee does not attach more, much importance to the pains and troubles pertaining to the body because he knows perfectly well that he is not the material body. He doesn't identify with the body, therefore he is free from the conception of false ego and is equipped with happiness and I'm sorry, and he and he is equipoised in happiness and distress. He is tolerant and is satisfied with whether comes by the grace of the Supreme Lord. He does not endeavor much to achieve something with great difficulty, therefore he is always joyful. He is completely perfect mystic because he is fixed in the instructions received from the spiritual master. And because his senses are controlled, he is determined. He is not swayed by false arguments because no one can lead him from the fixed determination of devotional service. He is fully conscious that Krishna is the eternal Lord so that no one can disturb him. All of these qualifications enable him to fix his mind and intelligence entirely on the Supreme Lord. Such a standard of devotional service is undoubtedly very rare. But the devotee becomes situated in that stage by following the regulative principles of devotional service. Furthermore, the Lord says that such a devotee is very dear to him, for the Lord is always pleased with all his activities in full, in full Krishna consciousness. Hmm. Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasdaya Bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamri Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatyade Satarine Panchakopa, Tarubhya, Kripa, Sindhu, Bhavacha, Patitanam, Bhavanebhyo, Vaishnavebhyo, Namaho, Namaha, 
Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare It's interesting, I was just looking ahead and at the end of every verse the Lord says is very dear to me, is very dear to me, is very dear to me. Such a person is very dear to me. And in the last verse he says, this person is very, very dear to me. <laughs> so these verses starting with this one, the verse 13 and 14, all the way up to verse 20, the Lord is saying, "What? who becomes dear to him? <laughs> Uh, of course, everyone is dear to the Lord because He is the Ajahambija Padapita. He is the seed giving father of all living beings. And so, for Him, everyone is dear to Him because everyone is His son or daughter. And therefore, He loves every living entity equally. Samoham, Samabhute, Shunamay, Dwaisistina, Priya. I am be no one, I'm partial with no one. I'm equal to everyone, but one who renders devotional service is a friend, and I am in a friend in him. So he also, you know, reciprocates. Yayatam mam prapadyante tamsta daiva bhajami aham mama vartmanu vartante manusya parta sarva shaha. As you approach me, I reward you accordingly. So if you're wondering why whatever's happening to you now is because how you approach the Supreme Lord. If you approach him in a certain way, that way he reciprocates. So that is, uh, that way we can understand how the Lord is reciprocating with us, how much mercy he's giving and how that mercy is understood and how it's coming. Basically how we approach the Lord. So sometimes Prabhupada said the Lord is like looking into a mirror as you look into a mirror, you get the reflection of the image that is on the other side of the mirror. So in the same way, the Lord will reciprocate equally according to how you approach him. But sometimes, due to his independent nature and his uh, love for his devotees, he may give more. Or, and that's up to him. But generally, he follows that principle of equal reciprocation, like that. Here, it's explained some of the qualities. Um, and one thing that Prabhupada wants to emphasize in the purport is that even if a devotee undergoes some distress in life, they don't blame anyone for their distress. Here, he says that the enemy of the Lord uh, I, I'm sorry, the enemy of a devotee is not the devotee's enemy. <laughs> the devotee doesn't make another person his enemy, although that person may make that person, the devotee, an enemy. He's not his enemy's enemy. And as it says here, he thinks, oh, that person has become my enemy because I must have done something in the past to deserve what I'm getting. And then he quotes that same, that famous verse from the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Tate nukampa shushamikshamanam pujane vakritam vipakam vidvabu bir badadana maste jivetio mukti padesha dayabak. It's a very powerful verse. Srila Prabhupada has put a lot of emphasis on that verse. It's spoken by Lord Brahma. After Brahma was foiled when he stole the calves and cowherd boys. <laughs> um, and then Krishna showed his a supreme uh, mystical power and bewildered Brahma. Brahma was thinking he could somehow out-trick Krishna. And now, being uh, humbled by Krishna's power, he's offering beautiful prayers, and this is one of the prayers. And the prayer is that it's very simple. Prabhupada, he says, he says to you, see, we say to the Lord, thanks to my past misdeeds, I should have suffered far greater than what I'm suffering now. Sounds like masochism, isn't it? <laughs> 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 
You know, you know, there's two types of people in the materialists, that the sadists and the masochists. The masochist loves to uh, enjoy, he loves to get pain. His pleasure is to be put into painful situations. That's a masochist. And the other one is the saddest is a person who likes to give other people pain. <laughs> now both of these are deterrent mentalities. They are features of a, a deformed consciousness, uh, a low consciousness. But here it says that even if one is suffering due to their execution of devotional service, they don't they don't blame the Lord, or they don't even blame anyone. They think, boy. I must have done something in my past, either in this life or in the previous life, that's causing this suffering to happen. Therefore, what the Lord is doing, because He's so merciful, He's given me only a small part of what I actually am, are meant to get. And therefore, I thank the Lord, and as He says here, so it's by the mercy of the Lord that I'm not getting all the punishment that I, am, I deserve. I'm just getting a little. Therefore, he's, he glorifies the Lord, thanks the Lord, and he becomes peaceful and happy. <laughs> no one's happy in the material world because they're always disturbed by situations in life. Uh, in other words, what are the situations in life that are disturbing? We try to obtain something, we don't get it, and then we lament because of that. That's one of the main characteristics of the human life, is they lament. Oh, I'm so unfortunate. Oh, I couldn't get it. Oh, I had it and I lost it. <laughs> so many things, right? This is, this is the feature of human life. The demigods are always joyful, the humans are lamenting, and the animals are always fearful, the three different levels of existence. So this is the material world, we're always lamenting. We want to get something, we don't get it. We, ha we hanker after it and we, we get it and we're happy, but then it, and then it doesn't give us the happy we want and then we lament. Or we keep it for a little while, it gives us a little happiness and then we, we lose it and then we lament again. Now, this is this is material consciousness, material life. But a devotee says here he's just happy with whatever comes. If Krishna he says and here he says Papa says he doesn't endeavor to achieve much things. He's always joyful. He doesn't make big arrangements to get things for himself. Whatever comes by the grace of the Lord, he's happy with. Hmm. And so devotees don't endeavor so hard in, in the material world to get themselves some kind of material situation that they think will make them happy, satisfied, successful. They're simply, they make a little effort in that direction, especially for those in Grihastha life. And for those in the other ashrams, they don't make any effort. They just simply depend on the mercy of the Lord. Like today, uh, I was just, you know, you know, I was ready to have lunch, and all of a sudden, uh, Bhaktivad Sal comes in with this nice thing made by Lalit Govinda here. It was some uh, vegan cheese, or something. I don't know what it was, but it was good. I was thinking, wow, now lunch is ex getting exciting. So I didn't ask for it; it just came, and it was nice. So yeah, so you know, the Lord just, you know, and you don't ask for something, it comes, and sometimes you ask for something and you get it and you don't like it anyway. Or if it, you ask for something that doesn't come and you're complaining. <laughs> so a devotee is always self-satisfied because they know that their happiness is to, to serve the Lord and to try to please the Lord by their service. And then when they do that, they, they know whatever they need to carry on in life, Krishna will provide. And if Krishna provo forgets to provide, the devotee is still happy, doesn't blame Krishna, doesn't blame anybody else. And this is peaceful life, this is calm life, this is free from disturbant life. And this is, um, the, this is, this is spiritual life. Because 
we have to lose everything at one point in life. Who's that? Okay, is it somebody I know? Ananda from Bosnia? My eyesight is a little dimmed. Okay. Wow. Thank you for coming. Hare Krishna. See, I didn't ask and such a nice person came. <laughs> We're talking about gifts that come automatically without endeavoring. <laughs> You just shouldn't just be, you were the example. Thank you. <laughs> so this is life, and the devotee is happy and satisfied. And sometimes we even get more than we need, and so we think, oh my God, Krishna is so merciful. He's piling on all these things, and what should I do with them? I have to give them away to the other devotees. So yeah, the devotee is never in scarcity for material things nor for anything in life because they simply depend on Krishna and they simply engage in devotional service. <clears throat> you know, Prabhupada would say Krishna is supplying or fulfilling the desires of the materialists and uh, they're getting what they want. But of course, they're not getting happiness, but they're getting what they want anyway. And Krishna is arranging for that to happen through the material energy, not directly. He uses the material energy to fulfill the, the, the desires of the materialists. But for the devotee, he does it directly. That's the difference between a non-devotee and devotee. Both are getting this, the things from Krishna, but one is coming through Krishna's agent, the material energy. And for the devotees coming directly from Krishna himself. So it's a more intimate relationship with Krishna. As a devotee develops his attachment for Krishna and engages in devotional service. And here, of course, Prabhupada said these are this verse speaks about the qualifi transcendental qualification of a pure devotee. But then again, you might say, well, I'm not a pure devotee. So how do I see this verse? Do I think, well, these qualifications are too, too lofty, too, you know, too far away beyond my ability? But no, these are mentioned as something we should aspire for. And what is the aspiration? That we become very dear to Krishna. So here, Krishna is, is, explains some of the qualities, and as we mentioned, he, he goes on verse after verse listing these qualities. And one is non-envious, a kind friend to all living entities. A person who thinks about the welfare of others will never become envious. So therefore it says we should think about the welfare of others and try to work in such a way as to help fulfill the, the needs of others and especially give them Krishna consciousness. That's one way. We also distribute prasadam, that's another way. We also distribute transcendental knowledge in the form of books. And we also, when we're interacting with people in general, and we're out and about outside of the temple, then we, uh, we just see that the conditions of living entities, they're in a very unfortunate situation. And uh, we don't, so even if they have big cars, or nice girlfriends, or big, or big muscle-bound boyfriends. We don't get excited about that, thinking, oh, God, boy, they're lucky. <laughs> we think, oh my God, they're suffering. <laughs> because we know that anything material, because of the nature of the When you understand the material nature, you understand that nothing in the material world can satisfy, you know, the, the soul and the heart. And I was I was just walking today, and I was walking around. I was I was just looking at people just to see how what they were doing while I was you know walking, and I can see they were just going about their regular affairs, and um, they look like they're ordinary. But you know, behind it, that activity, there is a whole story to their life that probably is filled with a lot of distress and anxiety, because that's material life. But they never show it in public because they don't want to reveal that as that that's that's what they're going through. 
because material life means you put on a, a nice show for everyone. And, and then you it's more like you're acting in a double play. The first play is that you're in the material world and you're not the material body. And the second role is that you act different than what you're actually experiencing in this world to make people think of you in a certain way. So people present themselves in a certain way in order to somehow or other look good in front of others like that. <laughs> and that is material life. It's just, it has no substance. It's just external, it's shallow. <laughs> but a devotee is happy. Why? Because they have, uh, they have devotional service, that's all. They can serve. Krishna always gives the chance for his devotee to do service. So that's the happiness the devotee experiences. I, I get a chance to serve. <laughs> it's not a small thing, because to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead is to serve the, the, the greatest person ever existed. <laughs> It's like if you get a chance, using the material example, if you be the personal servant of the king of the country, then you might think, wow, I'm really lucky. And Prabhupada also makes that point. He says that the servant of the Lord enjoys on the same level as the Lord. <laughs> Why? Because he gets all of the benefits that the Lord gets because the Lord shares everything with his servants. But being in that position to serve the Lord is the greatest opportunity. So for a devotee, uh, devotional service is the most satisfying thing because it elevates one, it brings one closer to Krishna, and it moves one ultimately to the point of going back home, back to Godhead, free from this miserable material existence. So therefore, these qualities, kind friend to envy uh, others, doesn't envy others, does not think of a proprietor already, does whatever possessions they have, they think, oh, Krishna is letting me use these, these belong to Krishna. So I can use them to live nicely and, uh, sat and satisfy my needs. Uh, they belong to Krishna, Krishna is using them. And that's true, because we come into the world with nothing, and we leave with nothing. <laughs> and therefore, in the middle, we think this is mine, and like that. But it's not. It's just you're just using it, and because and when you're gone, it stays here anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is, so no, we don't belong. Nothing belongs to us. Ha equal in happiness and distress. Well, that's a hard one, but. Uh, what is happiness? The happiness is, is the, uh, of course, what that means is that as the material energy changes and affects the de devotee in different ways, the devotee may feel some, some elevation or some tribulation, but it doesn't matter. It's all part of the body. It just happens. Okay, there's some suffering. Let me tolerate it. Okay, there's some happiness. Let me tolerate it. <laughs> there's a nice verse in the fifth chapter. Or Krishna, I'll read that verse in the fifth chapter. It's kind of, oh, I turned right to it. <laughs> Just by one verse, I missed it. Na parishyat priyam praptya no dijuat prapicha priyam stira buddhir samuda brahmavid brahmana stira. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant nor laments about attaining something unpleasant. So rejoicing, lamenting, who doesn't do either one, who is self-intelligent, not bewildered, knows the science of God, is already on the spiritual platform, transcendental platform. So that the first thing is meant to mention equal in happiness and distress. Mm -hmm. A devotee may be happy, but... Uh, he understands it's it's Krishna's mercy, that's all, <laughs> that I'm feeling this happiness. Well, he doesn't try to say, well, it's like, I remember in the old days of Krishna consciousness, the devotees used to think, well, this Krishna consciousness is so serious, so if I'm happy, that's not good. We should be.
fixed. <laughs> right, Mukund? Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Don't try to make me happy. <laughs> I'm not going to let you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, we were like that in the old days. We were thinking, some devotees, not everybody, we're thinking that to be happy, it's, it's, it's contra and Prabhupada. They brought that to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, if you're not happy, you're in Maya. <laughs> That's what Prabhupada said. <laughs> so, here's the contrary. Who is tolerant? Okay. Tolerant. Tolerance is one of the most important qualities for a devotional life because if you're not tolerant, you can't live, you can't continue in devotional service, you can't even live in the material world unless you're tolerant. Tolerance is a quality that applies to both the materialists and to the spiritualists. It's one of the most important qualities, learning to be tolerant. I'm just mentioning these because of time. We don't have much time, so I'm just going to mention. Always satisfied, self-controlled, engaged in devotional service with determination. What does that mean? That no matter what's happening, I'm going to stay fixed in my service. In other words, they're not swayed by what goes on around them. They're not, they don't lose their feet, their feet. Focus in devotional service. They stay fixed. Now that's hard because unless you're free from material desires, it's hard to become determined because our material desires will interfere with our determination. So the more you free yourself from material desires in devotional service, then the more you can become determined. So that, that determination is fortified by freedom from material desires. Um, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, always thinking of me. Krishna says such a devotee, after listing all of these qualities and characteristics, is very dear to me. Okay, so you get a little idea of what pleases Krishna <laughs> from these verses here. Okay, any questions? Comments? <laughs> yes. About what? Okay. I think we should stick to the topic here on the verses. And she wants me to speak about Aksaya Tritya. I spoke a little bit in the beginning and I gave as pretty much the summary that I was able to give. That's it. So let's stick to the to the verses here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, Mukunda Madhava. <coughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, so there is a there is a subject which is uh, interesting for me. It's about tolerance and uh, when uh, when do we tolerate something and when do we try to change the situation? You know, sometimes. Well, that takes intelligence to be able to discriminate between when to act and when to just tolerate. But tolerance is not an idle thing. Tolerance also means to try to understand what you can gain and learn from the situation that is being presented before you. Why is Krishna allowing this to happen to me? Oh, maybe he wants to pure me, purify me from some attachment. Maybe he wants to give me some knowledge. Maybe he wants to make me more dependent on him. These are reasons for tolerance. And 
But we don't tolerate nonsense in the sense that if someone's speaking wrongly and it's done in a public forum, we should speak up and could make some adjustment like that. Somebody's presenting something that is not Krishna conscious or not according to scripture. We don't tolerate that. Or if someone is abusing someone else, we don't ab we don't tolerate that if we're there. So a devotee never tolerates another person being abused like that. You speak up or actually do something. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it requires some discrimination based on the situation and try to see why, what is happening and why it's happening before you start to respond or don't respond. Mm -hmm. Because every situation may, may present itself differently and therefore there might be a different way to respond to it. Sometimes you just have to remain quiet and sometimes you have to correct the situation. But we tried, we, it's not about defending our false ego, that's the point we should avoid. If someone is abusing or criticizing another devotee, then we may speak up. Or if uh, someone is speaking contrary to Krishna consciousness, then we, we don't tolerate that. These are examples. Someone says something about us, we might just just tolerate it and go on. You know. Because if you don't respond to another person's criticism or anything towards you, then it ends right there. <laughs> Okay, and we can speak a lot of tolerance is a very, and there's two kinds of tolerance. The one we ma mentioned here, Prabhupada speaks that, Tatenu Kumpa Shusha Mikshamanu, that Krishna, you put me into this difficult situation, but I can see it's your arrangement to purify me from some material attachment. I could have, des I should have deserved much more suffering than I'm getting, but by, by your mercy, you only give me a small portion of that. That's that's one kind of tolerance. The other kind of tolerance is Marta Sparsis to Kuntiya Sitna Sukadukada. That there is cold weather, there is hot weather. Just like I was in India, it was 40 degrees. Couldn't go out in the afternoon, it was so hot. And I came to London, it was four degrees the next day. <laughs> so you know, I went from 40 to four, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, maybe I should be back in India. <laughs> but you know, you have to tolerate it, what can you do? And so the changings of the seasons, the heat and the cold, like that. Uh, the tolerance that comes by way of material energy. You get sick, you have to somehow tolerate it and try to get well at the same time. These are all examples of tolerances that are inflicted upon us simply by material nature. Any other Comments, questions? Ananda, 
Hare Krishna. How Krishna fulfills desires of everybody, uh, including uh, people who are not conscious of him, but they they are still not happy, although Krishna f fulfills desires. But I was thinking, but they desire to be happy. Actually, everybody wants to be happy, you know, in this world. So they want to be happy. So how come they not if Krishna fulfills their <laughs> desires? How come they're they are not if Krishna d fulfills their desires? Because you said, although Krishna fulfills desires. Uh, people are miserable. Yeah, in this because world. we are we're a spirit soul, we're, and the bo and the material desires are pertaining to the body. We're not the body. <laughs> Therefore, you know, I mean, if you're hungry and you eat and you get some satisfaction, you may all experience a little bit of happiness. But um, when it comes to things, if you want things, things can't give you happiness. What's ha where happiness lies is in relationships. Relationships is the basis of life and the basis of happiness. The quality of your own life depends on the relationships you have with others. <laughs> when you have a good relationships with others, you're generally happy in life. When those relationships are not good or even somewhere less than good, then there is a sense of unfulfillment it comes. Mm -hmm. I was just reading today some examples where two people very close to each other and were like school friends and they were both on the same soccer team. They were from India and they were they lived their life together very closely. But then one the father of one of the boys this got a job in another town, so he had to move. So he moved, and he that other boy was he lost his friend. Now they were they were distance apart, and he was unhappy because of that. And what did he do? He simply took to finding happiness in other things and eating a lot. So he just kept eating and eating and eating to, to somehow bury his sorrow in this false sense of happiness. Well, people do that. And there was another example of two girls that were close together and they got separated and the other one, she took the drugs. <laughs> and then when they met to each other after two years being apart, you know, it was very emotional. And... Uh, she explained, you know, after I lost your association, I just went for drugs, you know. So, yeah, relationships are the fulfilling principle of life. And when you have a, and the, the basis of that relationship is Krishna. So when you have a relationship with Krishna, then you can easily develop relationships with others that they become more natural. <laughs> You can try to develop relationships with others without Krishna, but then again, because Krishna is not there, the qualities of that relationships are more based on what, like, what can I get from that relationship. It's not so much a giving, but a getting. So then that, that makes the relationship, what we say, based on situations, and when the situations are no longer there, the relationship can also fall apart and will fall apart. Keep Krishna in the center and then you build your relationship around that because Krishna is in the hearts of all living entities. He's the basic principle of life and when we develop our relationship with Krishna, then because he is the mula or the center, then everything is connected with him and then therefore it becomes more natural and easy and joyful as we develop relationships with others mm -hmm. because Krishna is in the center. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Yeah. And we highly recommend that for married life. And if you keep Krishna in the center in, in the case of married life, then you can always work through the difficulties that come by way of relationships and move forward in, in those relationships. But without Krishna in the center, without religious principles being the foundation for the relationship, and then it becomes, you know, you have to have make me happy, 
and I have to make you happy, and, I'm, and you can't always make another person happy all the time. It's not possible. <laughs> it's just not possible. <laughs> Don't get into the idea that, you know, you can make somebody happy all the time. It's just not possible. <laughs> You're smiling, yes, it's true. <laughs> it's just the way life is, you know. But with Krishna in the center, then there is a principle that we both connect to through Krishna. And not that we connect, we try to connect to each other. Without connecting to Krishna, there is a break in that connection because Krishna is the connecting force. It's like when the wire is connected to the, to the socket, then the light goes on. But if the wire is somehow broken from the socket, although you throw on the switch, the light won't go on. Jai Sri Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Keep Krishna in the center. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.